Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, well, I'll do a quick introduction and then hand over to you. Hello, and welcome everybody to this week's uh, Imaging One World Talk. And I'll just wait a moment whilst everybody joins us. So they're coming in. There we there. All right. Um, yeah, so today it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Silvio Rizzoli to uh, give us a talk on um, uh, expansion, one nanometer resolution expansion microscopy. So Silvio um, did his BSc in uh, Bucharest, Romania, and then moved to um, the University of Colorado in Denver to do a PhD with uh, Bill Betts on, um, I guess, vesicle release, amongst other things in the synapse. And then from there, Bill Silvio went on to uh, do a postdoc in um, neurobiology at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical um, Chemistry in Göttingen, and then became a group leader in STED microscopy. I think you had a very good neighbor for, <laughs> in regards to that. But um, I think in that time, Silvio actually um, published some of the first live cell STED data. So this was uh, vesicles moving around inside him. A neuronal post uh, pro, um, process, as I record. So that was a, sort of one of the landmarks along the way. And now um, Silvio is the uh, director of the Department of Neuro and Sensory, Sensory Physiology at the University Medical Center in Göttingen. And with that introduction, I think we'll hand over to uh, Silvio to, to let us know what he's been doing. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, yeah, so I was I was asked to show not really our synaptic work, uh, uh, but to focus more on technology. So I will do exactly that, and uh, I will share my screen now. And I would appreciate if somebody could let me know if you can see my screen. Can yeah, yeah it's perfect. Okay, perfect. So, so basically, um, as you as you heard from Nick, I mean, what uh, what we are interested in is is a synapse. I mean, what you, what you see here is sort of like a molecular view of the synapse. Uh, you see the presynapse here at the top, and you see the postsynapse here at the bottom. They're both full of a lot of molecules, and we spent really a lot of years, a lot more than I care to remember, trying to understand how these things are organized. And it's not that easy. I mean, you know, it's just uh, um, both of the models of the presynapse and the postsynapse were made with uh, uh, mainly with that microscopy combined with electron microscopy combined with biochemistry, a lot of other tools. But the optical microscopy reached about, I guess, about on average, somewhere around 40 nanometers to see all of these molecules. And basically, you looked at one at a time with about 40 nanometer resolution, and you had to interpret where would it be located and how exactly would it look like. So it's really, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful system, but to some extent limiting. I mean, you know, we, we did want to go beyond the 40 nanometer resolution. So, um, you know, this is totally doable. I mean, you get the EM information for where things are, sort of where membranes are located. You get uh, a lot of biochemistry, mass spectrometry, you know, to see how many of your things are there. You get your super resolution and you get your modeling and you put it together. I mean, you know, this is entirely feasible, but how limiting is it? I don't really know. I mean, you know, when we look at this, this is a picture of a synaptic vesicle here. I mean, I bet you it doesn't look like this. I mean, this is a synaptic vesicle with a lot of molecules on it. These pink molecules are, are important in vesicle fusion and whatnot. And I'm pretty sure they have an arrangement. They have some sort of beautiful arrangements. I just don't think they look like random, like what we put them here in the model. So um, how can you see that? I mean, no, how, how, do you go, how do you go beyond? I mean, you have to go to a, a higher resolution. So such models, you know, where, where you put all of the molecules together, you know, this is this published many years ago, so we won't look through it, but but basically these type of models where you have all sorts of molecules that you put nicely together, they are only valuable to the point of telling you what is there. They don't tell you how the things are organized. You're seeing these red blobs here that we put there. This is another molecule in vesicle fusion. We don't know if that's exactly what they look like. I mean, we just didn't have the resolution to really tell whether this was real or just what we imagined. 
So how do we get a better resolution? There are many tools and there are some out there that uh, you have heard already about. For example, MinFlux has been invented uh, more recently by Stefan Helsi's group, also here in Göttingen. Um, and they, they have beautiful data showing, you know, resolution down to about one nanometer there. Or, or localization precision down to zero two nanometers. So there's quite a bit of work out there, but we decided, okay, let's go maybe to another direction that maybe um, will also work. So, you know, I mean, we didn't really know at the time and I must say, we still are not 100% sure how well uh, our work uh, uh, really functions in the real world of, of, of biological samples, but bear with me and let's just go through it. So we were fascinated by the expansion microscopy when it came, uh, um, invented by Ed Boyden, as you know, in 2015. Ed published this beautiful seminal paper showing the, uh, uh, basically you could take a bit of a half a brain here of a mouse, and then you could expand this linearly about four and a half times, you know, and then you had the nice beautiful piece of brain where all the fluorophores are basically farther apart. Uh, than, than in the original specimen by about four, four and a half fold. So it improved your resolution just by blowing up the specimen. I mean, this, this sounded so, 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 so cool. So we decided from 2015 to work a bit in this direction. And, um, you know, how it works, it's really remarkably, remarkably simple. Even I as a biologist can understand it, which doesn't happen for every uh, physics-based tool out there. What you have is a bunch of molecules, um, your single molecules in, in buffer, or perhaps your, your culture, your, your tissue specimen, you know, who knows? You have these guys and you have them, uh, uh, let's say, perhaps fixed. Then you can do an immunostaining, then you anchor uh, acrylamide moieties onto your different molecules, including your immunostaining antibodies, onto the various molecules here. Then you break them into pieces so that you can separate the molecules later. Uh, first, of course, you want to, inter to introduce them into a gel. You want to introduce everything into, a, into an acrylamide gel. Then you break them, sorry, into pieces. And you can do this with proteases. You can do this with uh, alkaline conditions and high temperature. And then you have sort of broken proteins in which every piece ideally is bound to the gel. And then you have to expand the gel and you do that by, by uh, essentially having in your gel um, a sodium acrylate. The sodium acrylate is negatively charged, the acrylate. And when you wash away the sodium ions, that will leave you an acrylate um, that repels every acrylate, repels every other acrylate around. So that kind of like forces your gel to grow by the acrylates gathering a lot of water dipoles around them to shield their, their negative charges. Um, when you have salt, the salt will do a very good job of shielding. Then you don't need all of these water dipoles around the acrylate and then the gel just shrinks. So uh, there are some difficulties with it. For example, uh, the gel will be rather, uh, shall we say, rather flexible and then and, and soft and then squishy. I mean, you know, it's not a super hard material that you can work with. There are possibilities to embed this into a new gel, but of course, that's an even more complicated procedure. So. Um, uh, every, every new step that you add into this system will add some, some more complication and possibly some artifacts. So, so far, you know, you can expand your things and then, then you have a reasonable, a reasonable picture. Now, how, how good does it get? This is from some work of ours a few years ago. Um, we decided four and a half fold was not really ideal for us. At Boyden solved this by doing uh, iterative expansion. So expanding one time, then embedding again, expanding again. Um, it is definitely doable, and Ed kindly sent, sent a colleague of his to teach us how to do this properly in our lab, so we now also know how to do it, but we decided it might not be a bad idea to go for a gel that just from the first step enhances uh, uh, the size by about tenfold or more. And this is called the extend gel, and you see here some synapses uh, subjected to extend expansion, and you see multiple molecules here. Um, for the aficionados, um, Bassoon and Homer are, are part of the pre and post synaptic densities, and the synaptophysin just marks synaptic vesicles. So you get you get quite a few nice pictures, and you get some nice orientation of the molecules, and um, you know it's not all that bad. Um, how do we get even better? 
So, you know, I mean, we reached, we reached a level of resolution with the tenfold expansion, which exactly where you would believe, I mean, somewhere between 20 and 30 nanometers, that's basically your, your normal optics divided now by 10 due to the tenfold expansion. So not too bad, but it still isn't fundamentally better than the, than the steady imaging that we used for all of our other synaptic studies. So can we get better? And then we, I, I must say that we kind of ran around in circles for, for a bit of time. I mean, I, we didn't progress all that much until we thought a little, you know, at some point we decided to just sit down, stop running around and just sit down and think about what we are doing. So we, we eventually came up with the following idea and that is you're doing your anchoring of your specimens, you're doing your gelation, you're doing your breaking into pieces and so on. Then you should mount this into some sort of uh, chamber for stabilization. So your gel is not really running around on your, on your specimen stage. But then how do you image them in opt optically to get a better picture? The first thing that was quite logical because we had uh, uh, the stead microscopes around, we have a couple of stead microscopes in the lab. So the first thing we said, okay, let's just put these gels under the stead microscope. The way it works, uh, I guess is familiar to quite, uh, to probably uh, most of you guys. Um, what you have, you have one laser uh, um, that would stimulate the flow of force and another one, a depletion laser that is uh, shaped like a donut that will now deplete all of the fluorophores outside of the dead center of your donut. That means that you are going to enhance the resolution by only allow, allowing fluorescence from specific fluorophores, from specific areas, so to say, in your specimen. And you're going to scan this, this, this donut and the, 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 the stimulating laser. You're going to scan them across the specimen, and then you're going to collect a, a, a picture of your specimen. And we did this, and it's possible but it's a huge headache. I mean, it's the gels are very uh, uh, dim because once you separate things in three dimensions, tenfold in each of the dimensions, I mean, you end up somewhere around a thousand fold dilution of your specimen. This means your specimen is pretty dim. It's not, you know, 100% uh, uh, amazingly stable. So it, there will be some drift, there will be some problems like this. Eventually, it's not really uh, um, about as good as, as let's say, um, stead of uh, on a normal specimen. I mean, this is like very suboptimal stead on a you know on a specimen that's just not meant to to be imaged in stead microscopy. So it didn't really give us a resolution of more than let's say about give or take five to five to ten nanometers, which is which is good but not great. Another possibility would be to do single molecule localization microscopy. And the problem is that most of the procedures for single molecule localization are based on switching buffers that allow you to switch on and off fluorophores and just to, to look at where they are located and to collect very nicely their position. And they, most of the ties that were beautiful in, in single molecule localization microscopy do not really like to do all of this switching on and off in a, in a pure water environment. So you have to put all sorts of other components to your buffer, and then your gel says, oh, there are, there's buffers there, okay, and it just shrinks, because once you put the salts back into your gel, the gel just shrinks. So this didn't work either. It does work in the hands of some other, some other guys, but uh, in some other labs, but still the resolution that has been attained um, is somewhere around uh, the five to 10 nanometers, maybe a little bit low, maybe a little bit higher, depending on the lab, but not easy and not really going, let's say, uh, uh, really, really down. The next point was, well, why don't we just use um, the type of, of uh, let's say, a type of analysis that is based on registering fluctuations over a long time in a movie. So you, you take a movie of your specimen, you register fluctuations in the movie, and then you try to uh, um, interpret the positions of the fluorophores from these fluctuations. There are a couple of softwares that are used out there for this. One is a SOFI uh, invented by Jorg Enderlein, who also happens to be in Göttingen. And the other one, and this is uh, quite popular, is a SURF invented by Ricardo Henriquez. And Ricardo uh, has, has uh, 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 very nicely distributed his software um, throughout the community, and it actually is a wonderful software. So we decided, well, we can do this, and um, it's easy to record intensity fluctuations. I mean, the floral force are separated from each other reasonably well when you expand the tissue, so fluctuations should be even more 
more uh, easy to analyze than in a real specimen. So in a sense, the gel, which is dim and, and has a thing separated, and that's why they don't kind of like add to each other to give you a bright fluorescence for, for, for regular imaging, for fluctuations, the gel might be actually quite ideal because it separates the things, allowing you to see more fluctuations. So, okay, that was the idea. Then we have our pieces of our specimen that are all reasonably far away from each other. And if we now measure fluctuations, we might actually theoretically go in the direction of about one nanometer resolution. And this would be basically uh, working with pretty much every microscope. You wouldn't need necessarily a, a single molecule localization microscope or a stat microscope or something like that. You could just use any microscope, record a movie of your gel as good as possible, then rely on the on the software of Ricardo Henriquez, and then just just uh, uh, you know take your take your reconstructed image in the end. And we did do that, and we could look at a lot of different things, and I'll, I'll show you the results in in the next slides. How does it work? Well, you, uh, the faster you can you can image your gels, the better, because it is. Uh, if you image fairly slow, then you won't image fluctuations very well. If you image extremely fast, then you're going to be better at, at catching fluctuations. So you're just measuring little areas, actually quite tiny areas in your specimen, and you are you are measuring very fast the signal fluctuations there. And then you are breaking your pixels into many subpixels and trying to look at correlations in these subpixels across the entire movie, across your movie, which will be typically up to about 4,000 frames. And basically looking at where the fluctuations come, where, were coming from, then allows you to pinpoint where the molecules, the fluorescent molecules probably were located. And you see here, for example, what you get after a couple of hundred frames, then a thousand, then 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 frames. Um, eventually, it doesn't change very much. After about 2,000 frames, the, 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 the specimen doesn't look like it's changing very much. And you'd start to look at something that looks like a molecule. I mean, in this case, it's supposed to look like one single molecule. So, um, OK, well, I mean, in theory, it should work. I mean, uh, in practice, let's see how, how far we can get. Um, a good part about this type of approach is um, once you expand the fluorophores, your signal to noise increases. Obviously, the distance between fluorophores increases, and that is vital to measuring fluctuations, but the signal to noise also, also increases. I mean, these are, these are just single nanobodies on a piece of glass, and they are the same nanobodies, but now from the glass, they were embedded in, 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 in uh, gels and they were expanded. Obviously, the, the, the um, and the spot that, that the fluorophore makes looks the same. You know, the spot that the nanobody makes is pretty much the same, but now it's surrounded by nothing. It's surrounded by, 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 by you know, dark space. So that tells you, you have a higher signal to noise. Even in this absolutely ideal specimen where there is no background or nothing, you still have a higher signal to noise. Uh, it increases about twofold in this specimen. It increases by quite a bit in all sorts of specimens. And this is known in the expansion community. In the expansion community, people have mentioned for a long time that expansion is a form of clearing your specimen. You basically remove quite a bit of the, of the background. So this should also enhance the ability of the surf to work. Well, I think there is some sort of unwritten law that everybody who does super resolution microscopy has to look at, at, uh, at, at uh, microtubules. If you don't look at microtubules, uh, uh, you know, you can publish a paper, I suppose, with, with uh, super resolution. So we did look at microtubules and you see here, this is a stead picture and we have microtubules that look reasonably well. This is just a classical, I fix the cells, I put primary antibodies against the microtubules, and then I put secondary antibodies and I just look at them. So just classical, completely classical immunofluorescence. By expanding tenfold, you know, it looks bigger, but it's not like you learn a, a lot more. If you do this, this procedure now, which we, which we called one nanometer expansion microscopy, if you do this procedure, you start to see the fluorescence in a lot more detail, and then you start to sort of see the hole in the microtubule. Um, we also, this was using our 10-fold expansion gel. This is using with, with a three and a half fold expansion gel, and you still see your, your expanded specimen, and, and then you see your, uh, your hole in the microtubule quite reasonably. And if you are doing just that, because of the various limitations that I mentioned already, you don't see the hole in the microtubule. Your resolution is limited to, to somewhat higher than you would need to actually see uh, this, this sort of specimen uh, well enough. 
Um, let's make another change here. You have your secondary antibodies. You get, you get this sort of like broad microtubule because of all of the size of the primary and secondary antibodies. This gets to a size of about 60 micro, uh, not microns, of course, 60 nanometers. Um, this is about what you would expect from electromicroscopy. There is classical electromicroscopy on this uh, from, the, from the 60s and 70s that shows you the size of an, of an antibody decorated microtubule, which is about 60 nanometers. So this is about what you would expect it. If you take your secondary antibodies away and you replace them with secondary nanobodies, um, of course, the signal becomes dimmer because a nanobody has one to two fluorophores, while antibodies have more fluorophores on them. Um, but you get a thinner microtubule. And in this case, it gets to be about 30, 30, 30 something nanometer in size, which is again, it's about where you would expect the, the size to be, knowing that you removed all of these secondary antibodies. So, so far, so good, but it's not like you really learn a hell of a lot because. Um, well, it's still antibodies, and, and the size of the antibodies obscures much of what you actually should be seeing. So we said, well, let's just have a deeper look. And this is some, some deeper look at, at, at one of the microtubules that was decorated with nanobodies. And at some point when we were looking at it, we were like, why do we see duplets quite often? So you see these little circles here, and you see a, a two thing, two thing, two thing, two again, two again two again in here and so on and so forth. It's a lot of little duplexes that we saw. And we were like, is it possible that, that, that we are seeing the single uh, fluorophores on the nanobodies? It turns out that's most likely what these guys are. And we said, well, let's just test that. So let's just have a, a, an object that is made, for example, of multiple nanobodies. And for that, we have a GFP molecule. It has a so-called alpha tag, which was, uh, 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 which was described a few years ago. The alpha tag is a very, very uh, strong binding tag for the so-called alpha nanobody. And this nanobody just binds here as the alpha tag, and there's two other uh, uh, nanobodies binding the GFP itself. And then you have all of, these, uh, all of these things binding onto the GFP. You see triplets of dots like this that look rather reasonable. So, so far, so good. I mean, you can see you can see these triplets here. This is with another color combination, and you can see a bunch of triplets in your specimen. As I told you, you are not looking at a huge field of view all the time. You're looking actually a pretty small field of view, but there's always many such triplets that you can that you can notice. Then we said, okay, fine, let's try to try to get better resolution. Excuse me. Um, let's now use the fact that we have two fluorophores on the different nanobodies. You have two fluorophores here, two there, two there, and so on. And let's just look at this. And here you're looking at GFP. You're looking then at one of the nanobodies, another one of the nanobodies, and the third nanobody happens to only have one fluorophore here. That's another, another view of another two, two, and one fluorophore. So sometimes the nanobody either has only one fluorophore or um, only one was bound to the gel and the other one just was lost. But you can tell, you can kind of like draw lines and do all of this line scanning and look into these things. And you can tell actually, you can look at very small objects and you can start differentiating fluorophores at a very tiny distance from each other. Um, these are some more examples. All of this, by the way, is on BioArchive since August and we are kind of working on it, trying to improve it right now. Um, but, but all of these pictures that I'm showing you are already in the BioArchive, so you can, and you can download and look them up. Um, these are some more views where you see you know, all sorts of arrangements where you see your nanobodies and very often you can actually see the dual fluorophores and it kind of looks like what you would expect. What is the perceived resolution? I don't know. I mean, this is, resolution is a, is a bit of a, a bit of a difficulty. And may, maybe some of you guys can give us some ideas on how to measure resolution because in the end, it's actually quite, uh, quite a complication. So, you know, we measure resolution by telling how far apart can two objects be that we can separate and we can separate things that are within, you know, uh, half a nanometer to one nanometer from each other. We see two chlorophores that are at a, at a perceived half a nanometer to one nanometer from each other. We can kind of like tell them apart. The size of a spot, it's depending on the color channel between about zero something nanometer and one nanometer or so. Um, we can do a Fourier correlation map 
um, and just see how how the image behaves at an image level and, and you know the pixels that contain this uh, type of, uh, of, of, of nanobodies in this case will will give you a, a Fourier uh, correlation ring uh, um, map of about one nanometer at the minimum so what can I tell you I mean this is there are many measurements that you can use and it looks like the resolution is somewhere around the one nanometer uh, uh, give or take you know question is okay that is kind of like an empty number uh, resolution what can you do with it I mean can you see something with it we judged that okay if we have if in if in principle we have such a resolution then we should be seeing real molecules and these are some examples this is an, an IgG and you can start to see the, the, the binding domain what we think are the two uh, the two FAB domains and here's the FC domain, and you actually, this is a secondary antibody, so you can even see the fluorophores on the secondary antibody. This is an IgA, and you can see like, like the two bind, like the two arms at the top and at the bottom of the IgA and, and the, the middle domain in the middle, of course. Um, this is an IgM, which is supposed to have one, two, three, four, five arms, and then a middle domain, and that's pretty much what you see here. So, you know, we, we can kind of see the shapes of individual molecules. These are some more examples of antibodies. These are like some primary antibodies in, in solution. These are some secondary ones. These are a whole bunch of, you know, like collected pictures of various things that look like antibodies. Um, these are some more IgAs, and you can see various views of those. These are some more IgMs, again, various views of those. I mean, they kind of conform to what you would expect. I mean, you can't expect them to be a, a lot better due to all sorts of, you know, the labeling is never going to be homogeneous. The, 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 their position in space will never be identical, one molecule to the next, and so on and so forth. Our enhancement resolution is only in the XY plane. Don't forget in the Z axis, we are basically confocal confocal divided by the expansion factor. So there's the confocal divided by 10, meaning like 60 nanometers in comparison to one or something nanometers. That means not a lot, you know, 60 is pretty bad. So, you know, due to these limitations, um, I would say actually these pictures are rather reasonable. You know, that's about as much as you could expect. Um, what else? These are some other molecules. This is the GABA receptor, um, or one GABA receptor from our colleague uh, uh, um, Radu Aricescu from Cambridge. Uh, Radu sent us these GABA receptors to look at, and you know, we this is what we think sort of a top view, a side view, and probably a bottom view or something. And size-wise, they are around the size that you would expect. These are some more views, tops, sides, bottom views, you know, whatever. Um, this is something called autoferlin. Autoferlin is not a very well-known molecule. This is, um, it's never been crystallized. Um, this is an alpha fold suggested form uh, for autoferlin. It would be sort of like a little flower here with one domain far away from the flower and one transmembrane domain a, a, bit, a bit closer, but still not within the plane of the flower. And this is kind of what it looks like when you look at one microscopy at it. You know, this is a linker domain. So this is most likely the C2 A domain. <clears throat> this is a C terminus uh, 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 transmembrane domain. And these are some more views. Sorry, I just have to take some water. Hmm, I was teaching for some hours today and my, my throat is completely dry. Um, and here, for example, this is one uh, um, experiment with Otto Ferlin where we did 3D imaging, so sort of trying to scan through the specimen, and you get an idea that you have this flower-like middle domain here, and then you have the two other domains, uh, one a bit one a bit closer, this one and this one, you know, some some distance farther away from the rest of the molecule. So this does look reasonable, like the alpha fold prediction. Um, and these are some more examples. You know, if you're taking just your control buffer, there's nothing in there. These are some other overviews of the autoferlin, and, and often they look like they have like this flower with this little tail and so on and so forth. What about changes in a molecule? Can you see that? Well, this is calmodulin. Calmodulin is a small calcium buffer. If it binds calcium, it enlarges a bit. I mean, this is, this is calcium-free is fairly small and with calcium is about one to nanometer, between one and two nanometer longer. 
And you kind of see it here, it's a bit longer here than here, you know, we kind of like extended its this head part or whatever, kind of extended it. And you can actually measure this. And this is um, over a, a whole bunch of molecules, but you can tell, you can tell your, your uh, size separation. This is using proteinase K to break the molecules into pieces. The same thing you can observe with using just heat to break the molecules into pieces. Um, heat leaves your molecules a slight bit smaller, but um, on average, I mean, on average, you can really uh, tell that, but it's not a huge difference. I mean, we're talking about fractions of a nanometer on average. And these are some more examples, of course. I mean, this is with calcium free tends to be a bit smaller, with calcium uh, uh, tends to be slightly elongated. But we can tell, so basically that tells you, you probably can tell some sort of dynamics of molecules. Now, this is all single molecules in buffer. Can you now look at real specimens that are more interesting? These are synapses. You are labeling here synaptic vesicles. They are labeled from the inside. So there is like inside the vesicle, you have, you have antibodies taken up live and you kind of see this round vesicle. When it fuses, it either stays as a little cluster of molecules as uh, my lab and many other labs have claimed over the years. Or if you break uh, the, the interaction between cholesterol and vesicle molecules, then the vesicle molecules kind of like run away from each other and make some sort of like smudge on the plasma membrane. You know, they don't, they no longer stay like a, like a real clump. And you can quantify this, of course, and everything. Um, you can look at the post synapse. This is a front view, a 2D view of the post synapse. This is a 2D side view. And you can see various molecules, a different and different heights in this in this arrangement. And this is known from, from the work, for example, of Chauvet Zhuang and many other colleagues afterwards. We know about the layering of the different molecules in the post synapse, but it's nice that you actually can, can see that again. What about a front view at the highest resolution we can get to? It's kind of like giving a whole bunch of dots. And every time I looked at these dots, it just seemed to me like there is some sort of regularity to the dots. I mean, this, this is a tiny domain, you know, you see the, the scale bar is 10 nanometer here. So this would be called um, in normal studies using stem microscopy or similar, in normal studies of the postsynaptic density, you would call this a domain or a cluster. Now it looks like within this domain or cluster, there is a substructure. So, and every time I kind of looked at them, it looks somewhat regular. And um, if you put hexendiol, this is an alcohol which is supposed to break down liquid phases. And the postsynaptic density is supposed to be a liquid phase. If you put hexendiol on, you still have a dotty system, but it no longer looks regular. You see how, how rather homogeneous this looks? Well, these guys don't look homogeneous anymore. And this is if you average uh, postsynaptic densities around, let's say, a central spot. Well, you kind of have these rings of spots, and the, it's quite a bit of, of, of overlaying. And you put the hexendiol, and this overlaying doesn't really happen. I mean, you know, it starts to look a bit messy. So it may be that that uh, that uh, postsynaptic density has a semi semi or quasi regular pattern, and then you can analyze this in a lot of ways. You can basically draw lines and just see this regular pattern that looks less regular with X and diol, or you can do many many types of other measurements, and they all kind of point to the same thing. There is a quasi regular organization to these to these uh, spots in the postsynaptic density, and you can change that biologically. So do you need a high resolution to see this quasi-regular pattern? This is just expansion stead. And if you look now at the, at the PSD95, well, I mean, you certainly don't see this pattern anymore. Also because look at the scale bar. Here is 100 nanometers, here is 10 nanometers. So, so basically maybe part of this will form a pattern, uh, um, but certainly the whole thing is just too big to, to form a pattern. Um, if we dial down the resolution of the, uh, of the expansion surf, the one that we call one uh, microscopy, if we dial down the, the power of that using basically uh, an epifluorescence microscope and, and less, uh, less uh, optimized um, movie acquisition, then the difference between expansion stead and one microscopy is minimal. I mean, basically they both look the same. 
So, so it tells you, this tells you it's not about labeling, it's not about, uh, let's say, other type of fancy effects, it's just resolution. It's just about the imaging resolution. If you don't have it, then, then, then these mini dots here coalesce into domains that you just, well, will later on call domains. Um, can this work have some sort of practical, uh, uh, some, some form of practical use? Um, in one word, I don't know. Um, but maybe there is something we can do. And that is, um, as an example, we, we took uh, um, uh, um, a database of patient material that we had, and we took uh, cerebrospinal fluids from patients, put them on cover slips, immunostained them with an alpha synuclein nanobody, which was developed by Chris Dobson uh, in Cambridge many years ago. Excuse me. And then, then we labeled them, then we fixed everything, mounted, and we measured them in, uh, in one microscopy. And then what you see is uh, what looks like single nanobodies, what looks like some sort of semi-large objects, which looks like some sort of fibrils. And then you have things that look like various types of oligomeric arrangements. And what you might want to know is that um, this protein called synuclein this is the protein that goes bad in Parkinson's disease. This protein aggregates in Parkinson's disease from monomeric. It goes first to various small oligomeric uh, uh, aggregates, or at least this is how, how clinicians explain it to me. You know, I'm just telling you what they explain to me. So the small aggregates are the ones that bind membranes, punch hole into membranes and make trouble for the neurons. Eventually, they make large aggregates, and these are more neutral. The large fibrils, the large aggregates tend to accumulate in the brain. They are very visible in the brain, but tend not to be that damaging. So apparently, the, the damaging ones are the little, uh, the little forms, and especially these annular, these ring-like forms. Apparently, these just bind to membranes and punch holes in them. So we said, okay, can we see those? And well, obviously, you're seeing pictures of them, so yeah, we can see them. And these are galleries of patients. These are various controls. These are various PD patients. And what do we notice? I mean, this is not, these are not random objects. I mean, these are not randomized, what you're seeing. It's just examples of different categories for different patients. Um, and for the PD patients, we see a lot of, of small things. For the controls, we have to look hard to see these small things. It's either a few very large things or a large amount of just monomers. Then you can analyze them. Um, if you average what you see in the control, you see like a little dot because most of what you see is monomers. While in PD, you see something a bit larger because of all of the many oligomers. You can actually tell a difference. If you use antibodies, forget it because the antibodies are very large and the control in your PD won't really look very different simply because of the size of an antibody. But now you also see the shapes of the different things so you can start to look at them. The protofibrils and the fibrils like things are not different between PD and control, but all of the small objects, all of these oligomer-like objects, they are all actually more numerous in PD than in controls, all of them. And then you can make some sort of cutoff um, uh, for the density of these things, and you can separate PD patients from controls. Now, of course, I admit this is not very uh, advanced. I mean, this is seven patients and seven controls. Uh, in clinical world, uh, in in the clinical world, seven and seven means absolutely nothing, which I absolutely agree. Um, once we see something like this with 200 patients, then we can talk about it, but it gives the, the hope that one could make diagnostics on something like this. That's it. Sorry, so it just uh, remains here to, to thank all of the people who did the work. The work uh, owes 99% to, to Ali Shaib here, uh, Dr. Shaib, uh, he's done a tremendous amount of work and really uh, probably did every single experiment I showed you almost by himself, but also with a lot of help from other colleagues. Um, Ed Boyden, you know, did quite a bit uh, to, to support us, Marcus Sauer as well, uh, also other colleagues, uh, Sam Ingertingen, like Tiago Tairo, Tobias Moser and his department. Uh, other colleagues international, like Radu Aricescu in Cambridge, who gave us all of the uh, um, uh, GABA receptors. And I should say Radu had a tremendous input into the manuscript because he just challenged us to write it in a good way and in a way that actually a human being could understand, not something that, that, that just we like. 
and, 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 and many, 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 many other colleagues like Felipe Opaso, who invented this, this uh, triangulate objects, you know, made of different nanobodies, Ute and Abed, who did a lot of programming for us, and so on, and so on, and so on. So um, I would like to thank them and the people who gave the money for this work. And of course, I would like to thank you for your attention. So I will stop now, and uh, um, hopefully there are some questions. And I'll get some more water, sorry. Hi, Sylvia. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. So traditionally now we go straight into the quiz, which gives you a breather and um, <clears throat> also gives people a moment to uh, think about some questions for you. So I am going to uh, um, <laughs> I'm going to switch over to um, the Mentimeter quiz in just a moment. There we go. Start screen. Okay. Here we go. And yeah. right, we have. So, can you see the quiz over the landing page there? One meter, one meter. We've got a few comments, so let's see how many people we've got joined for the quiz. Okay, well, we got to. I can't see how many people are joined. I've my uh, that's not many. Oh, we've got five people so far. Let's see if we can get another person, another couple of people to sign up for the quiz. And uh, while we're waiting, um, oh, I've got six now. Uh, you can you can post a comment or you can uh, think about a question. All right. Oh, we got seven. Maybe one more, and then we'll go. Just to remember, if you get to win a fantastic fold scope, if you uh, if you are the quickest on the button. So, all right. Let's 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 start the quiz. So here we go. And here are our participants. Oh, yeah, we've got a good number today. Okay, right. Fast for points, and the points get you the false. How does stead microscopy function, roughly speaking? That is, it controls fluorophore emission behavior, measures lifetime of the fluorophores, or reads the native fluorescence of the gel. And the answer is just coming up. It is controls the fluorophore. Oh, we've got 13 people got that right. All right. We have Everybody paid attention. We have got a competition on our hands today. Let's see what the leaderboard says. And. <laughs> Brand the Broken and Egg and Millie, you're up at the top of the board with Democracy Mars and Tiger Baby hot on your tail. And it's it's really up to, up, it's all to play for today. Right, next question, question two. Yeah. Here we go, answer fast. Why is SURF better than single molecule localization microscopy in imaging gels? Is it because it produces artifacts more easily than SML, ML, it uses different lenses, or it does not have an absolute need for blinking media? And all 14 got that one right. They're definitely listening to you. So, so <laughs> let's see if the leaderboard has changed at all. And Oh, Millie and Egg and hello of Millie is yeah, Millie, Egg is in the lead. There we are. He is really neck and neck today. So this is uh, this is all about how fast you can play. And question number three. Which molecule is bigger, an IgG or an IgM? Now we definitely saw the answer to this one. So IgG, IgM, or are they of equal size? And I hope everyone's answered this one already. <laughs> okay, so we can differentiate a little bit. Yep. Okay. This might have uh, this might have turned things around a bit. Let's see. Egg didn't answer that one, so get all right, all right, all right. we have got a new leader, Millie, Hello, and Tiger67, and Johnny. It's still all to play for. <laughs> Next question. All right, question four. When calmodulin binds calcium, what happens to its size? 
it becomes longer, it becomes broader, or it becomes smaller. It becomes longer is the correct answer there. Let's see if we get a change of winner again. We've got million below up the top there. Oh, Tiger 67, you might have done enough to get into the lead. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Tiger 67, E.T. and Michael, you are now <laughs> on the top three. Uh, let's see where this goes next. Last question. All right. Why is alpha nuclein a, pro a problem for human health? The monomer is poisonous for neurons, the large aggregates destroy neurons, or the oligomers are toxic. What's the correct answer here? The oligomers are toxic. Right. So let's see who got to who got to the, the win this one. Ah, E.T. and Michael, who's going to win? E.T., you are the winner. <laughs> right, so if you could identify yourself to the organisers um, in the chat, uh, Old Scope will be wigging its way towards you. All right, and with that, um, Questions. Right. So we have uh, we got one question so far. So everybody else in the audience, we've got a couple of questions. Here we go. So Chris Chan, do you want to unmute yourself and ask directly, or sh or I can um, read it out for you? Are you there still, Chris? All right, well, I'll read it out. Very impressive expansion microscopy imaging. One, does Sophie Surf work with fourfold instead of tenfold expansion microscopy? Yes, it does. I mean, there's, there's a figure with the microtubules showing with three and a half fold. So it, it does work. I mean, it's just, it's just not, as, not as good. I mean, it, it's all a matter of the expansion uh, distance, you know. So it works. It works. It, it's not terrible. I, okay. I, can read, I can read this uh, this questions no no problem because they're in the chat. So how do you make the gel stabilization chamber? Um, we asked some engineers. They made it. Then we lost the plants. Then we re-engineered the plants. We should have them now. Uh, if not this week, in the next couple of weeks, you can write us an email and we can send you the plants for for uh, um, a regular machine shop and you can you can get it done. So now we should we should have the plants back. We had to re-engineer it. It's not a big deal. I mean, there's there's a lot of designs that will work. It's basically just to have um, a metal holder where you can put your cover slip and um, a plastic holder on top, which gently doesn't squeeze down, but gently uh, presses down on the gel to, to keep it from moving too much. So so this is this is not, not terrible. Is it going to be completely immobilized? Um, it's never going to be completely immobilized. Um, there, but but there is um, uh, this brilliant software from Ricardo does uh, take away uh, quite a bit of the of the um, um, uh, drifts, so it shouldn't be so terrible. But I agree. I mean, you know, having a good chamber does help. So, how long does it take to analyze one video using Surf? Um, a couple of minutes, not very much longer. The code has not uh, updated. You know, Ricardo has a recent uh, recent paper on BioArchive. If you may want to check called ESERP, which does update the software and it's it's quite nice. So, I mean, maybe you could use that one. Um, I have difficulties getting the right graphics card. Everybody does. Um, it works with NVIDIA cards. Um, use a modern computer with an NVIDIA card and it should be fine. It should be actually just a few minutes. Depends, of course, on the image size. If it's a very large image size, I imagine it would take longer. Does the organized postsynaptic structure uh, uh, compared to the other? Correlate with anything known by uh, by TEM Fibsem Kravelian. Yain, as the Germans say, uh, as a combination between ja, which means yes, and nein, which means no. So yes, no. So um, there is a lot of EM work on the presynaptic side, showing a nice modular, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, regular distribution. On the postsynaptic side, this has not been so easy to see. On the presynaptic side, there are papers on this already from the 60s in electron microscopy. 
So yes, it correlates with what we knew from the presynaptic side, and we kind of expect to see that on the postsynaptic side. We just never did. Um, I know that there is that there is uh, somebody else that um, is doing such work now with a different technique that might tell us in the future uh, whether this is also visible with other techniques. But I can tell you more. I know that there is somebody working in this direction, so there will be for sure more information on this in the next in the next months. Um, do you know whether nanobodies are compatible with autoclave denaturation and post-expansion labeling? Yes, they are. It's difficult. Um, they are. They have to be optimized quite carefully, um, and it may not every nanobody. Nanobodies like, um, let's say, domains. They, most of the nanobodies bind to a folded domain of a protein. If your denaturation destroys the protein, then the nanobody or destroys it in a way that this domain is gone, then the nanobody won't be able to bind. That being said, we have a couple of nanobodies that work with post-expansion post labeling. Um, a very dedicated postdoc in the lab made them work. Um, three, four other people before couldn't get antibodies to work. So her name is Eman. Eman uh, really could could make this work, and I mean it's it's a lot of patient sort of uh, uh, um, optimization work to make sure that you remove all of the stickiness, that you remove um, non-specific binding. But they can work. I mean they definitely can work. Yeah. Uh, Calmodulin imaging. Did you uh, do tagging or nanobodies? If tagging, how many tags did you do, and where did you place them? Neither. For this, I should perhaps, am I allowed to share again? Uh, yeah, yeah, please go ahead if you want so, to. So uh, I thought so, but you know, some, some talks have different rules. So I thought I would ask, let me just share again and give you a brief picture here because I think this is indeed an essential point. So I'm sharing again. What you are seeing here, is our imaginary view of one nanobody that has been expanded and broken into a lot, whoops, broken into a lot of little pieces. Now, each of these pieces is a peptide. Because it's a peptide, it has an N terminus. Um, there's, again, a beautiful paper on BioArchive showing you that, the, and maybe they even published it in a real journal in the meanwhile, um, but this, this I know from, from the spring or something. So. There's a paper showing the N terminus is very sensitive to labeling using NHS ester dyes, much more so than lysines. So pretty much every this every peptide that you see here, every single peptide here has an N terminus that can be labeled quite efficiently by an NHS ester dye. So what we did was to take the single molecules, put them in a gel, break them apart, and then come with an NHS, NHS ester dye and label the N terminus of every peptide that we could see. I imagine some peptides are not going to be labeled because the efficiency of chemistry reactions can never be 100%, but most of them probably will be labeled because they are quite sensitive to labeling with NHS esters. So I imagine you will get a fairly decently labeled uh, molecule in the end. And that allows you to see the shape of a, of a protein, basically because you see all of these individual pieces now that now have been labeled with an NHS ester. Um, the next question might be, which dye to use for this? And I tell you, um, we use fluorescein because of budgetary reasons. Um, one gram of fluorescein costs 700 euros. One gram of a good dye costs half a million euros. And you know, you, if you have gels the size of a soup plate, basically you start needing fairly large amounts of dye. And you know, we didn't want to bankrupt the university, so we decided uh, let's just because of universe, our university is anyway bankrupt, so we decided to to just go with a cheap dye. So fluorescing it is. We have realized that if you use better dyes, you can get better fluctuations. So we are exploring this and then trying to to. Um, get sufficient, uh, shall we say, information to really tell people it's worth investing into, into more expensive dyes. But let's see which is the best, and then I'll, uh, we're not done with this, with this optimization yet. I see that makes sense because the tag would have been disrupted by its expansion. I tell you one tag that is not disrupted by expansion, and that is this alpha tag that I mentioned earlier, because it's very, very short and it was designed not to be broken by proteases and not to be affected by fixation. So that one, 
um, I don't think it remains on every molecule, but that one does remain on some molecules and we have used uh, as a tag post expansion, it worked reasonably well. Um, but I must say, possibly many others will work. I imagine flag tag, mig tags, things like that, fairly short tags, I imagine they will work quite well. So I can tell you in the meanwhile, post expansion, a lot of antibodies work. If you ask somebody who's totally patient and totally careful to optimize the post expansion, and then um, your microtubules might look a lot nicer. Uh, our microtubules didn't look well because, or didn't look very good because, well, you have a 15 nanometer antibody bound by another 15 nanometer antibody before expansion, and then you're expanding it and looking at it. Well, it's it's big. I mean, they're just so big. Now, expand and fold puts the antibodies afterwards, they count as one and a half nanometers because your expansion has expanded the floor of the, 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 the specimen tenfold in each dimension, but, not, but the antibody counts as normal size. So it counts as much smaller, hence, it would be a much better image. But we have only started with that. Um, that's gonna be another publication, I would imagine, because this is this is something we're still ongoing. I would like to have 10, 20 antibodies working nicely in the synapse, and then I can do some, some uh, imaging that has some sort of biological meaning. Right. Good. Curti, uh, do you have any comments to make there? No, uh, excellent talk, Silvio. So, uh... Often, like when we take uh, these uh, frames for surf analysis, you know, the sum of frame data is as good as uh, surf in, in the sense that surf tends to give this, you know, classic artifacts. Uh, so did you look into that or uh, or not yet? And I, I was looking like, is, is the data in the public domain yet for the one microscopy? Or, no. Yeah. no. Nothing is published, so we are not yet putting everything in the public. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, how much of what we see is artifact? We are working on this. And um, one of the simplest ideas was to just take single molecules and try to reconstruct them and try to see how much of an artifact you have. I mean, you know, you're, um, the first thing that I'm concerned about is, well, it's expansion, right? So how bad will the gel be? I mean, how much will you mess up the molecular structure? Because each of the pieces of the gel um, binds a piece of your protein, but there is no free given rule that says your protein has to be perfectly kept in the way it was. I mean, you know, um, the expansion, we all believe it's isotropic, but how isotropic it is it at the nanometer scale? Nobody knows that. So we are, we are playing around and we are really trying, uh, trying uh, um, to work with this. Um, what can I tell you? Uh, my gut feeling now, and, and don't cite me because this is just uh, stuff that, you know, it's running these weeks and it's the results that we have so far, but it looks like you might have something like a plus or minus one to two nanometers, maybe two on average, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, might depend on, on which molecule it is, but it will give you some nanometer wobble of the, of the um, um, pieces that you, uh, that you label. So there will be some... Uh, uh, distortion of the molecule uh, molecule size. There, it's impossible that it's not otherwise. Because you're gonna, you're gonna even if there is up, even if the gel is perfect, your protein cannot be perfect. I mean, you you cut a peptide, and this might have a hanging end which is flexible, and depending on where, where this moves, your fluorophore will have a different position. So it looks like this is somewhere between the one and two nanometers. You have this distortion. Now, what about the software? Does this make any artifacts? Yes, it does. It's definitely prone to make, I mean, you know, this is not the type of, 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 of machine. I very much love the STED microscope because if that doesn't work, then you see nothing. You don't see any enhancement resolution or you don't see any signal. This will always give you something. If you have an autofocus uh, molecule that just gives you a few autofocus photons, you will still see something. I mean, you will still see some sort of, some sort of, 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 of uh, let's say, dots somewhere that will be computed to something. So you have to, you have to yourself know what the specimen is kind of supposed to do, to be, to be able to say, well, this doesn't look right, and then I'm going to optimize it until it really looks right every time. So it's not. Um, is it? Is there a way of automatically saying this definitely looks like an artifact? No or at least we don't have one now. So, so I think this is something that just requires improvement. Can we improve on this? 
I think if we if we improve the Z resolution, we will have a tremendous enhancement in what we see and reduction in the artifacts. So that's 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 the next thing to do, um, because once we ha you have a better feeling of where the stuff might be coming from, then you won't have uh, to worry so much about about artifacts uh, of autofocus mostly. So yeah, I mean, there's there's still a bit to quite a bit to characterize. Yeah. Yeah, on resolution, we will finish with one last question from Andre, which is like uh, your thoughts on using Minflux to improve the resolution. If, if I got, if I remember the question correctly, yeah. Um, to to improve it on on the gels, it wouldn't make so much sense. I mean, because um, you know, Minflux already has a resolution that is that is close to the to the single nanometer or even below. So I mean, why would you want to combine it with the gel? I mean, there you really want to go to the living biological specimen to look at the exact things. I mean, you don't want to introduce a gel artifact into this. So it wouldn't wouldn't make so much sense. I mean, I would rather just do mean flux directly. I mean, which which a lot of colleagues are doing. So so that's um, especially for live specimens. I mean that's that's just quite quite brilliant. And you know it, it addresses the artifact that the gels will not really ever solve, and that is they can't work live. So you can't expand the live specimen. So yeah. um, while the mean flux, you can apply to a live specimen. So that's that's um, um, you know maybe to be less affected by artifacts. Again, I mean you know it's always the question of um, what artifact do you want to live with, and and. Um, um, you know, I mean, I know I know results of, of mean flux in synapses. I mean, I work with colleagues that, that do this. Um, mean flux is uh, definitely doing quite well. The question is, if we manage to improve on some of the things that we have now, I mean, remember, our technique is not even a year old. I mean, you know, we first thought, oh, we might have something about the end of November, beginning of December 21. So we haven't really spent all that much time trying to improve it. I mean, we just try to see how, how far can we go and then, you know, uh, then we need to do a lot of improvements, but give us another two, three years and maybe we are not in a terrible shape. So yes, I would say right now mean flux is much more mature, but remember mean flux is seven years old. So or, or, or six years, six years old. It's six years old from publication. I mean, not, not from, in CP, from, from when it was started. I mean, from publication is six years old. So, you know, give us a bit more time, you know. Yeah. On artifacts, I think a famous microscope, it's uh, something like, you know, all imaging or microscopy is an artifact. Some of it is useful for science. Yes, so. yes, yes, yes. Of course, of course, of course. I mean, it's, it's, it's a matter of what artifact you, you agree yeah, can live with, you yeah. can live with, you know, and, and what yeah. question you are trying to ask. Of course, of course. Yeah. Excellent talk, and yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we will have a lot of interest also in this. Yeah. Sure, no problem. Okay, then.